Let's just open up in prayer. God, you, you are the author of life. You are the author of death. God, we have an appointed time with death. Um, God, and death came into this world not because of you, but because of sin. But God, we all have an appointment. And God, you give us life. And uh, we just pray for Sandy. I pray for her son, Brian, and her daughter, April, and even her grandson, Julian. Um, God, as they, um, as Sandy said to me, I, I feel like I'm missing something. And so I just lift them up to you. I pray for strength for them. I just pray, God, for the funeral. I pray that your word would um, go forth from the funeral. And God, that people would be exposed to your word, exposed to the gospel. Um, God, we, I just pray that this church would continue to be a light um, in this community. And I just uh, thank you for each and every one uh, here this morning. In your son's name, amen. So... I wanted to talk about the armor of God uh, this morning, and I have, I have an interesting thing here. Now, <clears throat> I, I know that some of you are into the history of the world, and so if you go according to genealogies, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work, this doesn't play out. But I want to I make something really clear that this author is coming from the idea that Jewish history, the tradition of the Jews, says that there are 3,700 years from creation to the cross, okay? So, that being said, <clears throat> let me just read this. It is estimated that more than 14,500 wars have been fought from 3,600 B.C. to present day, and that number keeps rising. In fact, during the same period, there have been 5,305 years of war and only 292 years of peace. So when we talk about war... When we talk about war, when we talk about um, armor, we understand it, we know, we get it. If you're not wearing your armor, um, and there are examples in the Bible of people not having their armor, there was a king that walked too close to the wall and they threw a, a huge rock over and they crushed him in the head. So if you don't have your armor on, uh, we, we know definitely what will happen. But we have, we have so many wars in this country, or in, this, in the history of the world, that we all understand where we're coming from, that we need to be prepared, we need to be ready. We can't say to our military, oh, well, go ahead and take the year off, it'll be okay, I don't think anybody will attack us. I think everybody in this room would be like, you're crazy, you're out of your mind. So when we look at this, we see that there's an enemy out there, and it's easy to look at the physical and say, there are people out there who want to hurt us. You know, how many of you lock your doors at night? How many of you are walking downtown Milwaukee and you see, you see some hoodlums walking towards you and you cross over the other side of the street, right? Or run, right? So, I mean, we understand that there is a danger. We understand, we see it, we get it from the physical side, but a lot of times we don't see the spiritual. Have you experienced that? I come in here on Sunday morning, I listen to somebody preach, Usually Pastor Tom, he preaches, that's great, I hear the best, oh, I slap him on the back as I run out the door, and I'm like, that was awesome, thank you very much, Pastor. And then I don't have to think about it for an entire week. Can you imagine if we guarded our country like that, or you guarded your house? Listen, just while you're here at church, that's the only time you can lock your house. Every time, all the other times you have to leave it open. That would make you feel really safe, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, it wouldn't make me feel safe. So... We understand that. I just want to go back into last week. We talked about being ambassador, but really importantly here, we, we talked about being reconciled with God and having that peace and coming into a relationship with God. And so let me just, let me just back up really quick and review that. That remember as sinners, Romans 5.8 says that we're sinners and because we're sinners, we're enemies of the cross. We hate, we hate God. We're enemies of the cross. So we line up, we're in Satan's army, if you will, and we're in his camp, and we're lined up to have, to have a fight with God, which if you stop and think about it, is not the most intelligent thing to do, okay? Picture that a little baby is going out to fight, I don't know, pick the strongest guy in the world. It's, it's not, it's, it's not going to work out very well, but in our pride, we see that and we say, yeah, we can take him. So we line up, and we're in the enemy's camp, and we understand that we're sinners. We see that we're a sinner, 
We see that Jesus died for our sins, and we believe that, and because we believe that, we're reconciled. Now we've taken out of this camp here, and we come over here into God's camp, and we're now a soldier of God, and now we're, we're in the same war. We never switched wars. We never switched battles, but we're fighting for a different side. So it's important to understand that Satan will tell you, oh, you don't have to worry about this, but he's the guy we're fighting against, right? We don't get our intel straight from the enemy, do we? Unless we're spying. I mean, if he wrote us a letter and said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to attack Los Angeles in 33 days. We'd send one back, thank you very much, we'll be ready for you. Right? That's crazy. We wouldn't do that. We'd be like, okay, so they want to attack somewhere. It's probably not Los Angeles, and it's probably not in 33 days. We've got to figure this out. Well, Satan is lying to us. He's telling us he's in a whole different camp. He's fighting against us. So as we're over here, we're lining up God's, in God's army. We need to listen to God and what to do and how to fight. Okay? So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the groundwork. We talked about this a little bit last week of being ambassadors, but coming out of Satan's camp and coming into God's camp. All right? So, with that being said, let's turn to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, we're going to read 10 through 20 here. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Now, Paul's writing this to the church of Ephesus, and he's finishing his letter here. And so he's, he's doing the, an in conclusion. So he starts off with, finally. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, because we're fighting, we're not fighting a physical battle. It's not somebody we can see or touch or, it's not physical. Because of that, we got to take up a whole different armor here. So therefore, We're in this battle here. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that my word, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul is saying here, hey, listen, I want you to take up the whole armor of God, not pieces, you imagine fighting a battle, picking up pieces, picking and choosing what you want and what you don't want? Can you imagine me picking up, me picking up some of your armor? You know, I'm not a huge guy, but I'm, I'm bigger than some of you. Can you imagine me picking up my wife's armor? You know, what are you, four and a half feet? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm going to pay for that one later. But the armor will come down to here, right? The sword's going to not be as heavy. The helmet may or may not fit on my head. Can you imagine me fitting into her shoes and trying to run in a battle? I need armor for me. I need something that's going to protect me. Can you imagine my wife running around in my armor? <laughs> you know? So think about when we need our armor, we need, I need armor that's for me. I don't need your armor. I need armor that's fitted for me. So Paul says, hey, listen, What I want you to do is take up your whole armor, take your armor that you can withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. I think it's really cool to see here that this armor is literally to stand firm. This armor is not to attack. This armor is not... Have you guys ever found that that Christians are some of the most unloving people? We We attack each other, don't we? And we use our armor, don't we? How many of you, don't, don't raise your hands, please. How many of you have had somebody attack you with scripture? Well, doesn't God say in his word, oh man, here we go. 
Now, and some of you can say, well, I'm supposed to do that. Okay, these weapons, this armor that we're given is to stand firm, isn't it? Nowhere does it say beat each other over the head. I heard a pastor say years ago, he said, you know, the children of God spend the majority of their time either shining their armor or fighting one another. And as you look at churches, I'd like to believe that this church is different, but as you look at churches, isn't that what we do? I shine my armor up until somebody steps on my shoe and gets it dirty, and then I swing away. And God says, hey, listen, and Paul says, don't do that. Listen, what we're going to do is we're going to stand firm. That's the purpose of this armor. So let's go to the first one, the belt of truth. The belt of truth holds everything in place. They, had, they have all this, we're going to go through the other parts of the armor, but they have these, they, you know, they have their clothes on, and then they have their uh, breastplate coming down, and they have, these things will all be flopping around, so they tie it all together with a belt, and it also gives a place to hold the sword. Can you imagine stopping for lunch and forgetting your sword? Now, I've worked with teens for a couple years. Do you know how many times we've left things? Do you know how many times we've had to go back and try to find things? <laughs> I remember one time leaving, leaving uh, Culver's. We were headed back from the Dells, and we left the Culver's there in the Dells, and we started driving back in about, I want to say about halfway, but maybe I'm wrong. One of the kids said, I left my backpack in Culver's. We've got to go back. Oh. So we forget things. We leave things. This, this belt gives us a place to put our sword. It keeps everything together. It holds everything together. Now, isn't that true in our lives that the truth will hold us all together? The truth will set us free. It's hard to tell the truth sometimes, isn't it? It's hard to hold to the truth. When the rest of the world is saying, ah, that doesn't matter, God says, you know what? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's easy, to, it's easy to go against that. It really is. Because the world says, eh, it doesn't really matter. But we have to look at perspectives here. The world follows who? Satan. The world follows Satan. Satan is the author of lies. He's a liar, a thief, and a murderer. God over here is truth. He can't lie. He can't tell you something that's not true. Whereas Satan is a liar. It's his native language. All he does is lie. So, the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. It's designed to protect the torso. There was, uh, it was cloth with pieces of metal hung down over it like scales. I think it's very interesting that a lot of things that we get in life that are like, we're so fascinated by, and we're just, we're so good at, the animals have. You ever find that? You know, we're so fascinated with planes. These, you know, these big birds up in the air, and the birds have been doing this for, you know, they're looking at us laughing. You know, hey, you guys figured that out. Good job. <laughs> right? But they have these scales on them, like, say, a snake or a fish, and it protects them. And it, these scales, they protect one of the things that this does not protect, and it was never designed to protect, was your back. So this hung in the front. Now this was a cultural standpoint, this, or this was a cultural thing in their time that they just did not do. Nowadays, if you, if you talk to a police officer, he's not gonna just have one in the front, okay? Or if you talk to somebody who's, who's in the armed forces, they're not gonna just put something on in the front. But during those days, that's what they did. They, it was just the front. Why? Because there's no retreat. The Romans didn't believe in retreat. It was die or win. Those were your options. And you'll see that in another thing, too, when we talk about it. But it was to protect. It was usually, or it was in the front. It was in, it was in the front to protect what's important. And it was probably one of the heaviest pieces of equipment because it needed, if an arrow got through or a sword got through, it needed to protect. And I like to look at this as this is the heart of the matter. We need to protect the heart of the matter. We need to protect what's important. You know, a lot of times, I don't know about you guys, but I'm in it for me. I'm a selfish person. When I allow sin to, to go in my life, 
I'm a selfish person, and it's about me, and I want to protect me. And it's the heart of the matter. That's, that's, my, that's, that's who I am when I, when I allow sin to control me. When I'm in the spirit, guess what? I'm about loving others. I'm about loving God. Interesting to see, once again, the two sides of the camp. Satan is all about himself. God is about love. We, we learned about that last week. God is love. Shoes of the gospel of peace. You know what's interesting? Let me just start with, let, let me get in the shoes first here. The shoes actually had spikes on them because you needed traction. Okay, so the Roman, the Roman shoes, when they went to battle, had spikes on them. But interestingly enough, the spikes were at an angle. So when you, when you step, the, the spikes would go down, but they, they were in at an angle so that you could not, pu- you'd have to really work at it to pull it out and move backwards. Those spikes allowed you to go forward with ease. Once again, no retreat. The Romans didn't mess around. It was either you go and you win this or you die. One of the two. And so these shoes, these shoes tell us, he's saying, hey, listen, put these shoes on. Listen, there's no retreat. As Christians, there, are no, there is no retreat. We don't give up ground. We stand firm. It's interesting, though, these shoes... These are the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. Once again, we're back to how many times do you know or have you done that you've come out just swinging? You know, picture this, and I've used this, I used this analogy a while ago. Some of you were here, some of you weren't. I apologize, whatever. Picture this. I, I'm sitting in a waiting room, and I'm going in to see the doctor. There's something wrong with me. All right? Bobby says that all the time. There's something wrong with you. So I'm in the doctor to see what is really wrong with me. And I'm sitting down there, and the doctors come out, and there's like five of them. And they're all fighting. And they're arguing with each other, and next thing you know, it starts getting physical. And they start swinging. And now they're punching each other. One of them's on the other one's back and he's just punching him in the ear hole and he's got him around the neck. And, and I'm sitting there waiting to see the doctor. <laughs> then the other one comes out and, and you know, they're, they're just going at and they're jabbing each other with needles and they're using this medical terminology. And at some point I say, you know what? This is crazy. I'm not sticking around here. I, these doctors are nuts. So I get up and leave the doctors all stop and they look and they say, well, I guess he doesn't really want help. We should pray for him. Isn't that how a lot of Christians are? We beat the snot out of each other. We're on each other's backs, hitting each other in the ear hole, jabbing each other with needles, throwing verses at each other, and then the person says, whoa, 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 I, I don't know that I need any of this loving. And they walk out the door and we say, man, we need to pray for that brother, we need to pray for that sister because... They just didn't want to hear God's word. Maybe it wasn't time in their life. And you see how silly that sounds? And Paul says, hey, the gospel of peace. They need that reconciliation with their father. They need a relationship with God. That's the problem. We talked about this last week. Homosexuality is not the problem. Adultery, um, stealing, cheating, lying, those aren't the issues. It's a heart problem. It's a heart attitude. And you know what? We need that reconciliation with God. We need that relationship with God. And as we get that, guess what? The Holy Spirit starts pointing out, hey, Aaron, don't lie to your wife. Hey, Aaron, don't cheat on your taxes. And he just keeps going and he keeps going. And all of a sudden, it looks like, oh, Aaron's getting his life all together. But you know what? The Holy Spirit is changing Aaron's life. Listen, we can be a church of doctors that come out and we stab each other and ride each other and beat each other in the ear hole, or we can, be a God, we can be a church of the gospel of peace. It's our choice. But either way you choose, you can't, it's going to be really hard to retreat. It'll be very difficult to retreat because those spikes in the ground, they don't allow for that. The next is the shield of faith. Shields were used primarily to protect the soldier from arrows, spears, and swords. 
The, sold, the, the uh, shields were fairly big. Some, some of the armies during that time had smaller ones, some had bigger ones for different, for different reasons. But a shield, a lot of times, was something that they could squat down and duck underneath. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have seen movies where they'll send like a hail of, of arrows um, and they'll even portray it in Hollywood as the sun goes dark because all these arrows are just coming down. You can get underneath that shield and depending on if they were wood or metal, they'd either stick in or bounce off. Um, but using that shield, and he goes on to say that the, the, the enemy is using fiery darts. So in this picture, I believe that Paul is talking about a metal shield. We can use it to extinguish Although early on the Romans used wood and they would dip it in water and they would keep them in water so that when they got stuck, the arrows would go out. But I believe he's using, he's talking about metal, I don't know that it matters. Shield of faith. You know what? Christ's blood, our faith is built on Christ's blood on the cross. You know, during my ordination, this was a number of years ago, I remember one of the pastors said to me, he looked at me and he said, Aaron, if you remember every single day to start out at the foot of the cross, you won't go wrong. Every day. Not once a week, not once a year. He said, come to the foot of the cross. You're a sinner. You need God. You need that peace. You need a relationship with God. Start at the foot of the cross every day. That is what our faith is built on. Next is the helmet of salvation. Um, it is to protect the head. It is not referring to salvation since Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and he's writing to believers, he's writing to Christians. So it's not, it cannot be referring to salvation, but more of a deliverance. We need a deliverance. We need, those helmets need to go on and it protects everything going on up here. To this day, our army still wears, they still wear the, the uh, my little brother calls them something else, but they wear helmets um, on their heads. Why? We know that if you take a shot in the arm, it's not going to be as devastating as if you took a shot in the head. So we need that deliverance from God. And the sword of the Spirit, he says to pick up the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon given. It is the word of God. It's so cool to know that when Jesus was here on this earth and he was being tempted by Satan, that Jesus himself used the word of God to the tempter himself. See, the word of God is something that it doesn't, we don't just read it and it just changes our life. We can, we can use it back. When we're in temptation, we can use it. We're in trouble, we can use it. We can use it to confess our sins. We go in and we read. And it says, confess your sins if, and he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us all from, right, if, from all unrighteousness. We know that, we see that. So it's, it's in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, it talks about all the facets that the word of God can be used for. The sword of the spirit. Um, so this morning, I was actually thinking, I was getting ready, and I was thinking, you know, what if you picked up the wrong armor? What would that look like? And I started thinking about David and Goliath. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel 17, starting with verse 38. 1 Samuel 17, starting with verse 38 here. Now, I love, I love these verses. I love um, David and Goliath. I think the story's phenomenal. Um, just, just from the perspective of what was going on, um, of David's heart. And let me, let me just back up here a little bit. This is how they did battles back in those days, okay? They didn't uh, do guerrilla warfare. Um, so they, they line up, and they have on the ridges, on the two ridges facing each other, one is the Philistine camp, and one is the Israel, the, the camp of Israel, and they're over here, they're over here, and they can talk to each other. And down in the middle, there's a valley. And that's where the fighting is going to take place. <clears throat> okay? So, David is a shepherd. We know that. Um, 
We don't have time to get into this whole story, but David's a shepherd. He's taking care of the sheep. Um, He even says to Saul at one point, a bear came and attacked my sheep. I killed the bear. A lion came and attacked my sheep. I killed the lion. Um, So we know that David was a very efficient shepherd. Okay? Um, But we're going to see that his armor is not the... uh, not the same as, as Saul's. In verse 38 here, 1 Samuel 17, verse 38. All right, now this is after David came and already talked to Saul. And, uh, and so Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped a sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested him. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Just like we were talking, when we use somebody else's armor, it doesn't fit us. God has given each one of us armor. And my armor fits me. God knows, and who better to give me armor than the God who created me? The God who knows everything about me. Do you know that he knows me better than I know me? How cool is that? And then he says, I'm going to give you armor and it's, it's going to be designed for you. It will, they all have the same function, but it's designed for me, and I will be able to battle with it. Nothing's going to be too great. Okay, so this is kind of a picture of that. And David says, oh, I lost my spot. Here we go. Um, David said, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose up five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and, as he, and he approached the Philistine. Um, oh, let me keep going. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? that you come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. We can fight any fight. With our armor, we can fight any fight. It may not make sense, you know, David going down to fight Goliath, and you know what's really cool, in, it goes down a little bit, a little bit further, and, and uh, Goliath says to David, or Goliath starts moving towards him. Goliath was an accomplished fighter. He was a warrior. And so he starts moving, getting into position. And it says that David ran quickly towards him. He just took off and he just ran full speed to him. I mean, he was confident. He knew you know what, I trust God, my armor will work. There's so many times in my life and in your guys' life, I believe, that guess what, we don't trust our armor. We don't trust God. We begin to worry. We begin to fret. Do any of you get anxious? Something happens that we can't see, that we can't control, and guess what we do? Oh man, oh man, here we go. Oh, what, what do I gotta do? I gotta do something, I gotta do something. Somebody do something, somebody do something. And God says, hey, listen, I already know how this is going to end. You should be running into the battle, not away from the battle. But you know what? We as humans, we don't, we see the physical. We see the physical side of this, and we start running into the battle. Or we start running away from the battle, I'm sorry. There was a, uh, there was a lady, she had <clears throat> some type of, rare cancer um it's like three people in the world have it and they found it and they said you know you have like six months to live there's nothing we can do um and she had she had a boyfriend i I believe they were engaged but i'm not sure and uh 
So she decided, you know what, I don't want to break his heart. I don't want to drag him down. I'm basically, I'm going to be done. So she broke up with him, and uh, he, he pursued her for another three months. And he finally he said, listen, I would rather be married to you and, than to have never to have all this regret for the rest of my life. He said, can we just get married? So after a little bit of persuading, they ended up getting married, and they had a honeymoon baby. And she went back into the doctor's office about a month, a month or two later and, uh, for, her, for a checkup. And the doctor said, there is something not right here. There's something wrong with the results. So they kept doing tests and they kept looking and he said, your cancer's gone. I don't understand what just happened. Come to find out, to make a long story short, by her having this baby, it changed the chemicals in her body and it shut this cancer down and she was able to live. God can fight any battle. They don't always end up like that. A lot of times we point to those stories. You want to go through in, in, in Hebrews 11, go into the faith chapter and we're always like, man, this is awesome. Look how God delivered. You know, look at David and Goliath. You know what's so cool about that story is David chose five smooth stones. Well, he knew, you know, my question as a kid was always, man, he thought he was going to miss? Do you know culturally back in those days, you kill somebody, their brothers are going to come looking for you. Guess how many brothers that Goliath had? Four brothers. He chose five smooth stones and said, bring it on. I'm ready because you know what? How dare you? defy my God. What do we do? I run. I'm like, I'm, I'm with the rest of the Israel army. Have you ever thought about that? As he's lined up, his brothers are making fun of him. The soldiers, can you imagine being a soldier up there and watching this 15, 16 year old kid walk down to fake, fake, face this guy that's nine feet tall. He couldn't even pick up his spear. Can you imagine David picking up Goliath's spear? He's using two hands and just, <laughs> give me a second. <laughs> this thing's heavy. And this is what he threw around. This is what Goliath threw around. Think about the size difference. Think about the age difference. Think about the experience. Whose team would you have wanted to be on? <laughs> Not the little kid. So as an Israel, as, as a soldier of Israel standing there watching, I'd be like, man, <laughs> hey, how fast can you run? because this is going to be over quick, and we're all going to be running like crazy. I'll tell you what, I know where I'm going. You see that cave up there? <laughs> I'm getting out of here. I mean, I, I'd be trying to stop David. Hey, hey, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. We're all going to pay for this. So think about, he's got two armies against him. And yet David walked down in that valley and said, you know what, I got God's armor on. What are you facing today? Are you facing tough times? Are you facing a past? A past that's catching up to you? A past that haunts you? A past you can't let go? Are you facing a present that you just went out of? Have you dropped your armor? Do you feel like Satan's just flinging art, flinging arrows and darts at you and sticking you with your sword, with his sword, and have you dropped your armor? I'm telling you, pick it back up. Pick it back up. It's the only way that we can stand firm. You know, it's, it's interesting in this day and age, we have pastors who will come out and say, you know, I, I got a book that's, it, it's basically about there is no hell. We have pastors out here in this country who are just trying to fit in and they're dropping their armor. We have people out there that will say, listen, just fit into society. It's easier that way. People won't persecute you. You don't have to make a stand. Well, let me ask you this. Do you want to be one of those soldiers up on top of that ridge watching the battle? Shaking? Scared to death? trying to figure out what the quickest way to run is? 
Or do you want to be the one heading down into the valley saying, you know what, God? This is all on you because I can't do this. You got this, though. First of all, we have to have a relationship with God. We learned that last week. You gotta, we got we to have a relationship with God. Let me ask you this. How many, times, how many times a week do you pick up your Bible and read? I will say that most people that Tom and I talk with, when things are really bad, people start picking up their Bibles. People will pick up their Bibles because, oh man, this is happening, that's happening. But you know what? We should be doing that every day. We should be picking up our Bibles every single day and putting on our armor. We shouldn't wait. Don't wait. David never waited. They believe, a lot of historians believe that a lot of these psalms that David wrote, he was writing back when he was a shepherd. And as he was going through his life and he was writing it based on his Based on his life, he was writing these things. At least in his head, he was, he was coming up with these. A lot of historians believe that. It wasn't that David all of a sudden just walked down one day and said, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to go do this for you. Let's do it. He was preparing himself. Every single day, he would prepare himself. So when the battle came, he was ready. Are you ready? Am I ready? Every day, are we putting on the armor of God? Are we spending time with God? Are we reading? Are we praying? Or are we just hoping to high heaven that when the time comes, everything will be okay? I know as humans, the worst thing you can say is, I got this. Because you know what? I say that. I got this. But I don't got this. A lot of times, I feel like I'm the soldier standing up on the hill trying to figure out from a human standpoint, how this is all going to work. And it's not going to work. It doesn't make any sense. You can look from day one. Creation doesn't make any sense, let's be honest. All the miracles in the Old Testament, they don't make any sense. They defy everything that we believe from a scientific standpoint. They, it doesn't make sense. Jesus coming down on this earth to die on the cross for our sins doesn't make sense. Why would you want to die for somebody who hates you? God giving us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us doesn't make sense. Life doesn't make sense. But God says, if you believe me and you do what I've asked you to do, I got this. Now, he's got this no matter what, okay? So I'm putting this on human terms. So please, let me, give me a little bit of liberty here. God's got this. He doesn't, he doesn't need me. He doesn't need me to put the pieces together. He doesn't need me to try to rearrange the puzzle really quick. God's got this. He always has and he always will. Are you ready to put on your armor today? Every single day, let's put that armor on. Let's pray. Dear God, I'm just thankful for this opportunity to share. God, I'm thankful for your armor. I'm thankful for the, we can fight, God. We can run. But God, you asked us to stand firm. And so I'm just, I just pray, God, that we would obey. I pray that we would, God, listen to your word and say, today I'm going to put on the armor of God. Today I'm going to meet with God. Today I'm going to talk to God. And when tomorrow comes up, I'm going to do it all over again. Because that's what you've asked me to do. God, I just pray that our flesh, the attitude of our flesh of I got this, God, we would be able to surrender. And God, that we, would, that we would be like David and have that spirit that, you know what, God, you got this. I don't need to conjure up anything special. I don't need to do anything special. I don't need to pray a special way. I don't need to run forward to the altar. God, it's all right in my heart. I need a relationship with you. God, I'm just so thankful for this opportunity to to worship you this way, and I just pray, God, that your words, that we would remember your words throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.